you should have a yellow attendance slip with a ticket attached to it. Faculty, part-time or full-time, need to fill out the yellow slip and drop it in one of the boxes and uh, near the entry on your way out so we can ensure that you get paid for today. You'll notice a little red ticket in the corner. You should detach that and bring it to the free lunch. There will be tables there where you can exchange your ticket for a gift from United Healthcare and Viva. And did I mention free lunch? Lunch will be in the courtyard between the cafeteria and the bookstore. We will be serving hamburgers, hot dogs, and veggie burgers. So, that's it for the formal announcements. I would, it is my great pleasure to introduce our ASO president and our student trustee, Sayaka Ridley. Good morning, Southwestern College. My name is Sayaka Ridley, and I'm the ASO president and student trustee. This year, our theme is how do we how do we create a cultivating environment? Well, I, I believe, I'm a little bit biased, but I believe that the answer lies in the clubs, the sun, and the ASO. When students join an organization, they join a community where they learn and improve not only as a student, but as a person. Sometimes students, they go to class, they go home, and they don't have the time or the opportunity to develop deep and meaningful relationships with other students and with the community. The importance of finding your niche inside the school. <laughs> That's funny. Um, to really have a cultivating environment. So the ASO does this by holding bi-weekly events. For example, we had the Halloween Boot Carnival where the clubs uh, went out there and had little carnival games that was free to the students. And that really showed that we're here. The ASO is here and the clubs are here for the students. We're also working on our broadcasting program, which is brand new. We've been working on it for like four years, the ASO has. And we're working on it with our, with our VP of Public Relations, Leo Pasquale, he's here with us, with our VP of Finance, Rosella Luna. And um, we're working very hard to basically give updates to the students through our four new TVs in the Student Center. We hope that will create some kind of sense of community as well. So, at this point in time, I actually want to invite the faculty to make an announcement at the beginning of your class for the spring semester and basically tell the students about our 72 clubs. Tell them about ASO, our student government, the Associated Student Organization. Tell them about The Sun, the school newspaper. Uh, and encourage them to get involved in school because that's what's going to create the cultivating environment for students to, to develop and be successful. So, thank you very much. And uh, also next up we have Dr. Nish. I found my niche. <laughs> thank you, Andre. Good morning, Southwestern. and welcome to our spring semester. I've been asked to give you a state of the district address and to make it concise, so I shall do that. I have notes. Uh, the topics that we're going to address today to get us started in 2015 start with students. I really want to talk about our students and, and the fact that this is and needs to be every day a student-first culture. I want to talk about our student success actions, where's enrollment, where's the budget, and what's happening with accreditation. When I developed my goals for 2014-15, I put students first right in the middle. That's my motto, and I want to see that every day when I come to work and every day when I leave work. That's why I'm here, that's why we're all here. And we have been emphasizing student success over the last few years. Every time we've had an opening day that I've been here, we've been talking about student success. And our staff development has been surveying employees to um, find out 
who do you think that we employ that really embodies that service to students, that culture of excellence to support our students and help them succeed? And Henry Aronson, here's his photo, came to the top of the list. Henry is a fabulous instructor, and he makes sure that his classes are relevant for today's students. He incorporates a lot of media into his classes, and he is one of the founders of our Southwestern College bloggers community. He's encouraging his fellow professors, counselors, and librarians to use blogs to reflect on their practice and build a virtual learning community. So kudos to Henry, that's cultivating excellence. We also have Jennifer Grillo. You will recognize her as one of our fabulous part-time English instructors. And she's also our Writing Center adjunct coordinator. Jennifer is helping our students find their inner writer by bringing the So Say We All literary and performing arts organization to Southwestern College. Student writers work with a writing mentor to improve their story, which is based on a specific theme, and then they perform it. And our students' first performance at the Hub at the Otay Ranch Public Library was standing room only. Thank you for what you do, Jennifer. Rose Williams. You know Rose as the Administrative Secretary in the School of Language and Literature, and Rose really does demonstrate to each of us how we can have an impact on students even if we're not in the classroom. She often stops what she's doing to counsel a student in need or direct that student to the person, the place, or the form that they need. She has the same care for the faculty in her school, and her dedication to students was recognized by the San Diego State University Community College Leaders Alumni Group. Thank you, Rose. Well, another favorite on your survey is our own Andre Harris. You know Andre, he is helping students and staff every day at our Higher Education Center in National City. He's personable, he goes above and beyond to provide excellent customer service to faculty and students with high integrity and values. Friendly, funny, a fan of the Steelers, and we'll forgive him for that. Thank you, Andre. And also cultivating excellence, it doesn't just stop with students, it's cultivating excellence and service to ourselves. And whom better to exemplify that than our own Terry Hashebrenner in human history. Yeah. She really does demonstrate the importance of serving one another, creating that culture of excellence that supports our students. She provides excellent customer service, always smiling, very attentive, very polite. She was honored Wednesday night as our new employee of the quarter. Congratulations. <laughs> so I think you get my point. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter where your office is. Each and every one of us are responsible to help create and sustain a culture of excellence, a culture of students first. So ladies and gentlemen, let's make 2015 all about students first. That doesn't just stop in our offices. I wanted to recognize the exemplary efforts of our governing board to support student success. They are really setting the foundation for all of us. I wanted to recognize their Student Success Summit, which was conducted in October. All constituencies were present. It was a very engaging opportunity for us to all discuss what we need to do to support our students and help them succeed in completing their educational goals. And that actually resulted in some concrete action. One of those is the uh, Governing Board Statement of Student Success, which they formally adopted at their meeting on December 17th. And at their meeting just last Wednesday, they approved a governing board policy and procedure for student success. 
And part of that is an accountability measure where we as staff will be demonstrating to the board on a regular basis what we're doing to help our students succeed. So I want to recognize and thank our governing board for embracing student success and helping show the way for the entire college. Thank you to our governing board. And I have the pleasure of introducing someone who's going to be helping us with one of our major student success initiatives. I think that you all know that this past summer we received a $2.3 million Title V grant and just starting this month is our new Title V director, Dr. Leonor Perez. Here's a picture. Are you here, Leonor? So very excited to have her. She has a lot of experience with students and with grants. Most recently, she was a grant program manager for the San Diego Symphony. Prior to that, she was managing a major grant for the Center of Excellence in Minority and Health Disparities at Harvard Medical. And she was for eight years the Dean of Research and Planning at East LA College, as well as serving for uh, the Chancellor's Office as an EOPS evaluator. You can tell that she has a lot of relevant experience and you can see the bullets towards the bottom of the screen. These are three of the major initiatives of that grant. First year experience, creating our college success team, which she'll be pulling together, an extensive expansion of tutoring for our students. So we're very, very excited about our third of What else is happening? Student Equity Plan, or SEP, you're going to hear that acronym a lot. We are so very happy that we have received funding from the state. We have submitted our plan. We have submitted a very solid plan. Reviewed the data, found out what helps our students, what hinders our students, and then we created high-impact, scalable, research-based interventions, and two of those are listed here. We're going to dramatically increase embedded tutors to help our students, and particularly with their basic skills, and we're going to vastly increase the professional development that we offer to you, our staff members, particularly our faculty members. So we are very, very pleased that we have our SEP money, and we are very pleased that we have the new matric, if you will, the Triple SP Student Success and Support Program funding. We are delighted that this funding will allow us to hire six new full-time counselors. We are in the recruitment and in the interview process right now, so we are very excited. We will soon have those folks identified. We are also hiring three classified professionals with this funding as well. The money will help us improve our core services, which include um, orientation and tutoring. More than 6,000 students have completed our new online orientation, which is fabulous, and our electronic student education plan module that's in our colleague system, we're going into full implementation this semester, which is fabulous. So we're really excited with the, our SEP and our triple SP efforts. So we've got all this great money and we're doing this work for students. We need to get the students in the door. Let's talk a little bit about enrollment. This is our enrollment for the past three years and then our target for this year. So you can see the targets have been growing and you can see that our actual enrollment has been meeting those targets and in fact we've had a little bit extra each year that we can bring forward. But I need your help because our enrollment this spring is a little softer, a little less than we want it to be and I want you to see where we're at. Compared to where we were at this time last year, our unduplicated headcount is down 3%. Our number of sections, however, is up 2%. So we're seeing right now that if we were going to calculate how many full-time equivalent students we have, it's 3% less than what we had at this time last year. Our enrollment fill rate, the number of seats filled, is at 79.3%. Last year at this time, it was 83.5%. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get the students in those seats. We need to meet our enrollment target. We need that for our funding to be able to serve our students. I know that we're doing great work in recruitment. We are starting a weekend college. 
where students can complete their GD courses in two semesters by attending one class on Friday and two classes on Saturday. Great initiative. We're doing a lot of outreach campaigns. Our students were even out at stores and grocery stores over the winter break recruiting students to come in. But I need your help and what I'm calling the first week push. Next week, we're going to have tons of students coming into our higher ed centers, our Chula Vista campus. Some are going to be trying to crash classes. Some don't even know how to apply. I need you out there helping them. No matter what your job title is, put your buttons on, be out there, help students find their way, and remind every student you see, we have open sessions. On the very front page, our home page of our website, we have a new um, facility there for you. You can just click on this uh, link to view our classes and immediately it will show all the open classes. Faculty members, next week in your classrooms, show your students this. Encourage them to take another class. If we could get every student that's currently enrolled to take one more class, we would meet and exceed our target enrollment. So this is a full court press. We need a first week push. Everyone, I need you to be helping our students, particularly next week, get into those seats. Quickly, gonna give you a budget update. This is very, very brief. There's far more news than is on this slide, and the budget news is good. We are anticipating continued triple SP and SEP funding. We are anticipating a possible base allocation funding of 1.6 million, which will help us address our increasing STRS and PERS contributions. The, but the governor has proposed a 1.58% COLA and has proposed enhanced funding for non-credit classes. Also, there's a potential of half a million dollars for maintenance and energy. There's a lot more to the governor's proposed budget. I encourage you to attend the budget committee, to attend SCC, to attend CMT, to attend the academic senate, and to keep your eyes peeled for the all user emails that will be coming from Dr. Stephen Crow, our uh, chief business officer. Governor's proposed budget looks good. We need to um, think about our planning on how to use those funds, and we need to make sure that that reflects what our students need. Lastly, 2015 accreditation year. This is going to be accreditation, accreditation, accreditation at everything we do this year, preparing for the visit in October. The first draft is coming out in February, February 9th. Two months for every one of us to read it and to provide input. Please get your hands on this and spend some time looking at it and provide your feedback because the second draft will be done April 9th. We will be moving this draft through the Academic Senate, the SCC, and the Governing Board. We're asking all three of those bodies to formally review and accept this before we submit it to the ACCJC in the summer in preparation for the October visit. I know that sometimes it feels really <laughs> difficult and frustrating to do your program review and your SLOs and your assessment, but folks, it's working. We are starting to now have the money to be able to fund all those things on those priority lists that have come from you through the program review. We're getting better tools to provide reports to show you what your efforts have achieved. And ladies and gentlemen, the conversation that you have about your student outcomes and assessment and how you can better create a learning environment for our students is the very thing that keeps our college alive. I think that this college has made amazing progress, particularly in the last three and a half, four years. We have a fabulous story to tell the commission, and I want to tell that story in the best possible way, and I know with all of your fine efforts, we're going to be able to do that. Last note, please uh, welcome with me a new cabinet member, a new chief information systems officer coming to us from Cabrillo College, Dan Borges. Dan is going to want to meet you all. Give it a hand. He wasn't able to make it today, so I told him that he is going to be my guest at my next coffee chat, which is going to be on February 5th. And I want everyone who has an issue with IT to show up, because this is the man that's going to help us resolve all those issues. So Dan, we're delighted to have him, but you know what? It's students first, and so I'm happy that I can conclude my remarks 
with welcoming our student speaker, Wilnor Jean. Wilnor was a shining star in the TILA learning community during his first year here at Southwestern. He's an EOPS student who sits at the top of his class as a nursing major by having earned a 4.0 GPA every semester since he started over two years ago. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Wilmer Young. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As she said, I am a father, a husband, a full-time employee, a dealer scholar, an Ethiopia student, a nursing major, and I'm on the president list. I'm going into my last semester before I transfer to a four-year university. My name is My name is Will Norman Shaw. But if you say jeans, it's okay. <laughs> I was born in Haiti, raised in Suriname, the only Dutch speaking country in South America. I have been cultivated as a student and scholar at Southwestern College. There are programs and individuals at Southwestern that have assisted and nurtured my success. Programs like Taylor, the Exponential Learning Academy. During my first and second semester, the Taylor instructor served as my educational and inspirational water source. Every time, I get thirsty, they were there for me. These three instructors positively affect my self-concept and self-esteem. The EOPS programs, Educational Opportunities Programs and Services, assist me with counseling, possibility to borrow books, money for books, uh, priority registration, unlimited tutoring and specialized support option. They are very good. Finally, we are at the writing center. Mr. Henry, my English teacher, would never be able to understand my essays. <laughs> they have me alive. It is the combination of these resources and a lot of hard work that has led to my 4.0 GPA. I would like to thank the staff, all the counselors, the tutors, all the professors that have helped me during my two and a half years at Southwestern College. Thank you to all of you for the work you do for students like me. And now, I have the very distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Jeff Duncan Andrade, is Associate Professor of Reason, Studies, and Education at San Francisco State University, co-founder of the Teaching Excellence Network and director of the Educational Equity Initiative at the Institute for Sustainable Economic, Educational, and Environmental Design. As a classroom teacher in East Oakland for the past 21 years, his pedagogy has been widely studied and acclaimed for producing uncommon level of social and academic success for students. Before joining the faculty at San Francisco State University, Duncan Andrade taught English and coached in the Oakland Public School for 
for 10 years and completed his doctoral studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Duncan Andrelio lectures around the world about the elements of effective teaching and school serving, poor and working. He works closely with teachers, school sites leaders, and school district officials nationally. And as far abroad as Sweden and New Zealand to help them develop classroom practices and school cultures that foster self-confidence, esteem, and academic success among all students. His research interests and publications span the areas of urban schooling and curriculum change, urban teacher development, and retention, critical pedagogy, cultural and ethnic studies. He has authored numerous journal articles and book chapters on the condition of urban education, urban teacher support and development, and effective pedagogy and urban setting that have been published in learning journals such as Harvard Educational Review and Qualitative Studies in Education. He has published two books with Peter Lang Publishing, The Arts of Critical Pedagogy, Possibilities for Moving from Theory to Practice in Urban School, and What a Coach Can Teach a Teacher. These books focus on effective pedagogical strategies for urban schools. He is currently completing his third book on the core competencies of highly effective urban educators with Rutledge Press. We are grateful for his presence among us today. I would like to introduce Mr. Duncan Andrade. Please give him a round of applause. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and for the uh, ridiculously long bio. And I'm particularly grateful uh, to the folks who set up this program and decided to uh, launch the morning with the cast of Rent singing that song. And this is why it's largely selfish. Uh, because um, that's my phone downloading pictures. <laughs> that is a picture of uh, my best friend and wife uh, holding our twin boys who turned two at the end of the month. And I left her with them by herself at 5.30 this morning. So I come here. And just to give you a sense about what that means for those of you that don't have twins and don't have my twins. I'm holding Tayari, okay? Uh, and that thing in his hand that's in his mouth is bark. <laughs> that he pulled off that tree that I'm standing next to and I didn't even know he was eating until I, 
picture, and I was like, what the hell is that in your mouth? <laughs> Stop eating bark, son. Okay, so that is who I left my wife with. Her favorite song in the world is that theme song from Rent. So I recorded it and, and sent, texted it to her, um, and so I get to sleep in my bed tonight. <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, the talk that I'm going to do today is, is uh, based on an article that I wrote for the Harvard Ed, Harvard Ed Review a few years back. Um, and so if there's stuff that comes up uh, in the talk, uh, you know, citations or references that I um, uh, refer to that you uh, think might be useful to your work and that you want to do a deeper dive on um, and you don't catch them, um, you can look uh, up the article and, and, and download it. Um, it's, it's the, the article title is the same title as the talk I'm going to do today. Um, so you can just find it on the Google. Um, if, if for any reason you can't, uh, my email's um, uh, there at the bottom. Uh, and, and you can feel free to email me. I'd be happy to send you a copy of the article and violate my publishing contract with Harvard. So I'm the youngest of seven kids. And uh, as the youngest, I felt like it was my birthright to complain about pretty much everything. And I remember one time I, I came in the house, I was ranting and raving about something. My mother stops me in the middle of my rant. And she points at the kitchen table and she says, sit down. She goes in the kitchen and she takes a glass and she fills it halfway with water. And she comes back and sits down and sets the glass between us. And she points at the glass and she says, half full or half empty. And my mom's was good for those kind of trick questions where there is no right answer, so whatever answer you give is the wrong answer, and that's the lesson that you need right now. And so I just kind of stare back blankly and take the bait. She says, son, how you choose to answer that question is how you will live your life. Because your life will always be both half full and half empty. And if you choose to see your life as half empty, if you choose to see your life for all the things that you don't have, you will never fill your cup. But if you can see a life that's half full, if you can see a life of the things that you do have, you will fill your cup, it will overflow, and you can share that with others. Now, this is precisely what I think that Tupac Shakur means when he talks about young people growing up in poverty as the roses that grow from concrete. Now, you come down wherever you want on pot. Cornel West says, no one free of spot or wrinkle. Okay? And, and I agree, I, I think pop deserves to be critiqued for some of the things that he said some of the things that he did, some of the ways that he lived his life, but who doesn't? What is undeniable to me, as a veteran classroom teacher, 22 years now in my community in East Oakland, and so I get the young people, okay, before y'all get them, okay, so they're with me before they come to you, okay? and then I get them again after y'all are done with them, because you come to the state, right? Come to San Francisco, okay, I got you. So, I get them on both ends, okay? In the high school piece, and then in the four-year piece. And so, as a teacher, as a father of two sons, as a community member of the 3400 block of East Oakland, and as a researcher, what is undeniable to me is Tupac Shakur's reach to teach across all the lines that we say as an institution of education we want to cross but we continue to stumble through. Pac reaches across race, across class, across gender, across political boundaries. Ten years ago, I was invited to start working with the Maori community in New Zealand. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the indigenous politic of the globe, hey, the Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And so if you put a, a pin on a map of the world on my block, 3416 Davis Street, and then you take a pin and you put it in Otara, which is the community, the Maori community just outside of Auckland, where I was working with these youth. It is literally the other side of the world. Because I'm not being hyperbolic here when I say I was on the other side of the world. And my first meeting is with a group of 30 high school Maori youth. And I walk in the room and they're all sitting in the circle. And this one brother hops up and he runs up and he says, you're from Oakland? I 
was like, yeah. He says, did you have Tupac? <laughs> and I was like, nah, Brian and everybody else knows each other like that. But it was deep to me that I'm all the way across the world, and the first question out of a young person's mouth is about Pac. Tupac was murdered in 1996. Your students are still listening to Pac. Brothers from Haiti it knows who Pac is. Some of y'all drove into the session today. Bump and pop. <laughs> so it's not hip hop. It's not popular culture. Because if it was, then all the artists that were from Pac's era would still be in young people's ears. There's something about Pac's message that is transcendent. And so, as a veteran classroom teacher, as a researcher, as a father, as a community member, I wanted to understand what is it about Pac's message that is so transcendent, particularly for the students that are the most vulnerable, particularly for the students we're struggling the most to reach. And how do I distill that message out and put it at the core of my teaching so that I can start winning more hearts and minds in my classroom? Now, I can tell you as a veteran literature teacher that I can take a crisp $100 bill and stick it inside of any Shakespearean text and leave that text anywhere in my classroom and it is completely safe. <laughs> but if I take Pac's book of poetry, which is the, up here on, on the screen here, okay, and it is the title of Pac's book, a lot of folks don't know Pac wrote a book of poetry. Okay? But Pox, the title of Pac's book of poetry is actually the title of probably his best known song. Okay? Or excuse me, his best known poem, which is The Rose that Grew from Concrete. If I leave this book out anywhere in my classroom, it is immediately snatched up by the very same kids that the system is convinced is not, are not interested in literacy. What I tell provosts, college presidents, superintendents, principals, teachers, and Arnie Duncan. Told this straight up to Arnie Duncan. It's not that kids aren't interested in literacy. It's that kids aren't interested in the literacy we're giving them. Okay? Those are two very different problems. Okay? And as long as we keep seeing the young people as the problem, okay, we'll continue to fail to reach them. That's the glass half empty. But when we can see young people okay, as the roses that grow from concrete, what Pac says in his poem okay, is that of, of course okay, the rose that grows from concrete has damaged petals. But why do you see the damaged petals instead of the tenacity and the will to reach the sun? That's our choice. We choose how we see our students. And indeed, many of our students do have damaged pedals. I have damaged pedals. Okay? I wear them in ink on my arms. So that every morning when I get out the shower and I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of who I am and who I come from. But school told me that that ink was my problem. School told me if I could just leave that ink at the door and come in as a blank slate, I'd be so much more teachable so much more valuable and have so many more opportunities. But you see, the problem when you got ink is you can't take it off. Those damaged petals are a part of who our students are. And it is those damaged petals that reveals their tenacity and their will to reach the sun. Every student that we work with is a glass half full and a glass half empty. Every person in this room is a glass half full and a glass half empty. And you know, as well as I do, that when you interact with folks that see you as a glass half empty for all the things that you don't have, all of your deficits, you do not work hard to spend time around them cats. Okay? And I understand that this institution has experienced that firsthand for some extended period of time quite recently. Oh yeah, your history is public. Folks be talking, y'all. <laughs> now, there are other people in your life who see you as a glass half full, who see you for what you bring to the table, who see you for your assets. Okay? And those are folks who you don't count hours around. Those are folks who you don't punch the clock on. You want to be around those people. It's no different for students. Okay? 
With students see that you acknowledge them as a glass half full. You don't ignore the glass half empty side. You don't ignore the damaged pedals, but you start by acknowledging their tenacity and will to reach the sun. Just how dull it is that you came. And I can build from there. Those are the educators that tend to have the biggest impact on the kids that the system is saying they're the most interested in serving better. Now, if we're going to do that, then we've got to understand Pac's metaphor better because the concrete is real. And the truth of the matter is that we don't get very good access to the most cutting edge research that is happening to help us understand how do we support and develop students that are emerging out of the concrete. So today I'm gonna to try and resource you with some things that have really impacted my practice and helped me to understand the concrete better and how to support and serve those young people. The first of them is this film series. It is a six part film series from PBS called Unnatural Causes. Of all the stuff I've read, all the experts I've met with, all the lectures I've been to, all the research I've done, nothing has more directly impacted my day-to-day -day practice than this film series. It has an amazing website, tons of resources for teachers. I know kindergarten teachers who use this all the way up to uh, professional development at colleges and universities around the country. It is a global study of the question just below the title, is inequality making us sick? Short answer, yes. Okay. Widely agreed upon across fields, public health, social epidemiology, neuroscience, economists, okay. all agree the biggest threat to health on the planet is inequality. Okay. So the biggest threat to health on this campus, the biggest threat to your campus culture, the biggest threat to your student retention is inequality on this campus. Inequality across classes. Inequality across departments. That's where you start. The unnatural conditions of human inequality cannot be manifested and reflected in our academic institutions. Otherwise, we are guaranteed that it will be reflected in the next generation in our society. These young people are the disruptors, but they have to experience something fundamentally different in the educational process if they're going to go manifest that when they enter into adulthood. Now, the research is clear okay, that the concrete is multi-layered, okay, it's deep, and it's toxic at all levels. And so we got to understand those layers and how they impact young people in profound ways before they ever step foot in our classrooms or on our campuses. Now I can't tell you which of these is most prominent in your community. You have to become an ethnographer of the students that you serve. You have to get better profiles. And this is a place where you can push at your administration to get real ethnographic data on the communities that your students are coming from. What is actually happening there on a day-to-day -day basis that is impacting their bodies and their lives before they step foot in front of us? Because if you don't understand that, then you're just guessing on how to support them. This is a list of some of the most prominent toxic elements that are existing in our society today that are affecting kids before they come to us. This is not a rank order. You guys have got to do that work on your own community to figure out how these rank in order and where you should begin to target initiatives to support students. And what I can tell you with a high level of certainty is about my own community. I told y'all in the beginning of the talk that I'm from East Oakland. And so undeniably, one of the most profound layers of toxicity that we experience in our community is violence. In 2006, the San Francisco Chronicle called us so concerned with homicide in our community, they started mapping it. And they said that we had the plague, which I find interesting because, as I said, I, I live in East Oakland. I live, oh, you're not going to see it because my, my point, I won't show up on these back streets. But, but I live hey, uh, right in the middle of that gray zone. Okay? And so, if we had the plague, guess what? I would be in trouble. Huh. Because the place of ultimate non-discriminator, isn't it? There's recognized race, there's recognized class, there's recognized gender. 
and certainly doesn't recognize political boundaries. But those red lines that just popped up are the city boundaries of Oakland. And you don't have to be a topographical genius looking at that map to see the outlier. What is it? Piedmont. And what the hell is going on in Piedmont where they can completely opt out of the play? <laughs> Cornell West jokes at Disneyland brags nobody's ever died on their premises. He says somebody probably has. They just push you across the line to keep their record clean. <laughs> I think that's what happened with that one ride up there by that Piedmont border. Right? That was probably in Piedmont. They're like, oh, hey, I'm going to get that back to Oakland. I don't know how to side in Piedmont. Over five years, we had 555 homicides in a city of a little over 400,000 people. And as you can see, our play has been almost perfectly quarantined between the 580 and the 880 freeways. What we call the flatlands, or the lower bottoms. And you don't gotta be from Oakland. You don't gotta be on your phone right now Googling Piedmont to know who lives in Piedmont and who lives in my hood. And you shouldn't know that. You should have to look that up. But you don't have to in this country. Because in this country, the broader society norms who deserves safety and who doesn't. So it's not even a question. When you look at a map like that, who's being exposed to that kind of toxicity and who is completely opting out of it. And the trick about our map is that Piedmont is inside our city. It is a city inside of our city, Coronado, completely. Okay. Sorry, I had to drop that one. <laughs> completely immunizing itself okay, from the broader needs of our community. Do you think students don't know this? Of course they do. So when they come into institutions that say to them, well, if you just work hard and believe in the dream that you can, that doesn't add up with that. That doesn't add up when you got Oscar Grant. You understand? That doesn't add up when you got Mike Brown. That doesn't add up. So, as educators, as people that are trying to disrupt this inequality, we have to confront it. We cannot pretend that that does not affect students' psyche when they come in and hear the same old rhetoric but experience a reality that is in direct conflict with the rhetoric of meritocracy. We've got to be directly confronting and disrupting that. In 2007, the San Francisco Chronicle gave up and the Oakland Tribune started working what they call a homicide map. These are the four most recent maps. They publish them on the front page of the Tribune every year. And as you can see, there's been almost no stemming of the tide. And so I decided that I would update the homicide map. I'm gonna do that for 13 years because that's how many young people are actually, how many years after young people are actually in public school before they come to you. This is nine years, yo. This kid has just entered my freshman high school English class. And you tell me where can a young person live in my community where they have now personally witnessed homicide, if not multiple homicides. And yet what's the conversation about in schools? Why isn't this a part of the accreditation conversation? Why isn't this part of the student support task team conversation? We act as though this reality isn't even happening in students' lives. Some of y'all, that's Oakland, that ain't San Diego. We don't have that kind of homicide. Look, that's the greatness about GIS maps. If y'all become ethnographers of your community, you can find which of those social toxins are dominating in your community, and you can do the same damn map for the neighborhoods where your kids are coming from. And I promise you, looking at issues around immigration, border, police, violence, poverty, homelessness, in a community like San Diego, you're going to have a nice, pretty map that you can start having very real conversations with about how are we addressing this in our curriculum, our pedagogy, our counseling, our tutoring, our student support. And the reason that this matters so much is because everything that we're finding in the medical research is that exposure to this kind of trauma and toxic stress, and let me be clear, okay, PTSD is not just for people who watch gunshots go off. Okay? Poverty causes PTSD. Okay? 
exposure to all these layers of toxic stress cause PTSD. But the problem is that most of the conversations about PTSD are focused on this dude, which is right because soldiers are particularly prone to PTSD. But nobody's talking about these brothers. These are my students. This is me on the camera. And this is us burying another one of my students. 16 years old, stabbed more than a dozen times in the face with a screwdriver about three blocks from my house. And that's who buried her. And the next day, all these young brothers are back at school. And what's the conversation about in school? Algebra, test scores, common core, no child left behind, college going culture, Casey. All of which matter. You can look at the data on the outcomes for the students that I teach. I believe students should do well on those things and go to college. The question is, how and for what? And because that's what the conversation is about. It's not about this and how those things connect or don't to this reality. Then so many kids that are experiencing this reality find school, frankly, irrelevant. And in fact, that is a rational response to an irrational set of conditions. It is irrational to think that in this context, schools would emphasize those things over the humanity, health, and well-being of children. And yet we do it all the time. That's who's coming to you, is kids that have that relationship to the institution. And they are looking for something different. They are looking for something bigger than themselves. And we know better. And I have evidence that we know better. In fact, we have tons of evidence in this country that we know better than to keep acting like this isn't even happening. I'll give you one example. Columbine. Because when this happens in Columbine, Colorado, the response is totally different, isn't it? Can you even picture situation in Columbine where the next day them kids come back after that shooting and the algebra teacher's like, what do you mean you didn't do your homework? You're not invested in school. You forgot your backpack again, you forgot your book again. You can't even picture that. Some of you are literally laughing right now because it's so absurd to think that we would talk to wealthy white children that way. And yet we talk to the nation's most vulnerable youth that way every day in school. We act as though it isn't even happening. And every time we do that, silence is complicity around these issues. And when young people see us in that way, Herb Cole said it best, young people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And if everybody knows this is going on in our communities and we don't directly address it institutionally every day in the ways in which we teach in our classrooms, then we are suspect morally in their eyes. And that is something that we gotta come to grips with because when we interview students, that is what they say why they don't trust school. That is what they say about why they leave. It's not about the work, it's about the relationships. That's the starter and the ender. And that's exactly what I heard from you, brother. When you were talking about why you're a 4.0, it was about relationships. People here on this campus have built relationships with you. And we hear this over and over and over again from the students who navigate these toxic conditions. Now, all the stuff that I've read about how to do that, because okay, that's dealt like it's easy to stand up here on stage, all my slides work, there's no students like cursing me out or like falling asleep in my class right now, so it's like I'm, you know, I'm a G, right? <laughs> of all the stuff I've read that has impacted the way in which I think about how to do this, okay, this is the, at the top of my list. Boy Has Raised His Dog is written by the nation's leading medical doctor that treats trauma in children. In each, of, each chapter of this book okay, is a story about um, young people that have experienced trauma in their life, how it manifests okay, throughout their adolescence and adulthood, okay, 
and the ways in which you can respond and to become a healer instead of a contributor to the toxicity of their life. Very pragmatic, and, and, and he speaks directly to teachers and educational institutions because he says, as is accurate, we're off in the front line in these kids' lives. Okay, we're in the interrupters okay, or the continuers of the pattern. Now, we always talk about being data-driven. Okay? I think you should include this okay, in your accreditation report because you've got to have data in there. Okay? So let's add some new data. Okay? I actually don't have a problem with being data-driven. My problem is, is that we're looking at all the wrong damn data. Okay? And when you look at the wrong data, okay, then you come to the wrong conclusions. And when you come to the wrong conclusions, then you continue to implement programs that don't shift the meter. And then you blame the people with the least amount of power for not shifting the meter. So let's be data driven, okay? I'm with it, okay? But let's change the data that we look at. Let's actually look at process data instead of outcome data. Okay? All of the research and improvement science suggests that if you look at outcome data, you can't shift outcomes because you don't actually understand what was causal, what produced the outcomes. So everything that we see in systems that are moving themselves is about, okay, that's cool, we're gonna look at that outcome data in a minute. What we wanna understand is what are the set of processes, practices, and relationships that produce that outcome, and then how do we improve those because we know that's what actually moves the meter on the outcome meter. Well, when you start looking at that data, you start asking a different set of questions. You start asking what's going on in kids' lives so that we can actually produce a community responsive approach to educating the young people that come here. When you start looking at that data, what you find is data like this. The national data set suggests that one in three urban youth, one in three, display the symptoms of mild to severe PTSD. And when they compare that to the Pentagon's data from soldiers returning from live combat, what they found is that urban youth are actually twice as likely as a soldier coming straight out of a combat zone to have PTSD. In 2011, Harvard School of Public Health said, actually, okay, that's not even an accurate assessment because PTSD stands for what, y'all? Post-traumatic. So in 2011, Harvard School of Public Health released an entirely new diagnosis because what they're seeing in young people growing up in poverty is a set of, of, of uh, traumatic stress uh, symptoms that are more complex than what they find in soldiers. Because soldiers, that diagnosis is correct for soldiers, post, because soldiers leave the battlefield. What about young people? Right, they're returning to it, right, regularly. And so they're finding that the symptoms in young people who experience recurring trauma, recurring exposure to toxic stress, are more complex in the biorhythms, the neural pathway development, than it is in soldiers coming out of live combat. And we're not having this conversation at all in education, even though we're expected to support and develop those young people. The reason this is so important and, and, and look, you can go and read you know, all the public health stuff and the, and the social epidemiology and the neuroscience or you can just listen to Tupac. Because they're saying the same thing. Right? David Williams at Harvard School of Public Health says the biggest threat to health on the planet is the accumulation of multiple negative stressors with output sources to cope. This is exactly what Tupac talks about. Multiple negative stressors. Right? Public health talks about stacking stressors. So if you've got a student that's struggling and you really want to support them, the first thing you've got to figure out is what are the negative stressors in their life. Okay? Because those are the things that you've got to start getting them support, counseling, and resources for. And the reason this matters so much is because when you are stacking stressors, your allostatic load increases. And right? so everybody that is working with young people Everybody in this room, period, should understand at allostatic load because you all have allostatic load. Here's how it works in the body. This is a set of graphs straight out of a medical journal. Okay? At the top right, is a normal stress experience. And let me just be clear. Right? You will never catch me telling anybody to live a stress-free life. 
Okay, there's only one group of people on the planet that lives a stress-free life. Dead people. Okay? So don't aspire to live a stress-free life. Okay? It's coming, don't worry. <laughs> Stress is a natural part of the human condition. Okay? And it's actually good for you under normal stress conditions. Okay? Because under normal stress conditions, it looks like that top graph. Right? So a stressor enters your life, right? And what is happening uh, on the x-axis okay, is that time is passing, okay? End of that stress moment, okay? Under the y-axis is your physiological response, okay? So you see the uptick. Okay? Once that stressor enters your life, okay, that's a set of chemicals that is firing off in your body to allow you to overcome that stress, right? The one that you are the most familiar with is adrenaline. Right, so when you are under stress, your heart starts pounding, okay? uh, uh, the muscles around your, your neck region, your jawline tighten up, your forearms tighten up, okay? you're actually physically faster, you can run faster under stress, your brain is sharper, your memory is tighter, because all of the resources that are, that are being allocated elsewhere in your body suddenly get narrowed just to deal with that stressor. So your body has an incredibly sophisticated response that you don't control. Right? The one chemical that the medical community is the most concerned about that occurs under stress moments is cortisol. That is a chemical that you should all know about. Because cortisol has been direct, the overproduction of cortisol, which is only caused by exposure to toxic stress, the overproduction of cortisol has been directly linked to the four biggest unnatural killers in this country. Type two diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, all caused by overproduction of cortisol. All caused by toxic stress. But in a normal stress event, okay, that goes through your body as well. Okay? But it's not overproduced. Because you hit that pinnacle, you dealt with your stress moment, and then there's a period of recovery. Okay? So your heart doesn't just go back to normal okay, after the cop pulls off. And some of you are like, what do you mean? Like, that's just Joe back there. It's like, what's up, dude? Okay. Yeah, not everybody has the same stressors, right? When OPD pulls up behind me in my neighborhood, which is under gang injunction, okay, I forget how to drive. I literally start putting my, making turn signals and shit out the window, right? Got my blinker on, I'm not even turning. I tell him, what's wrong with me? Right? Then he turns off as a, right? But not everybody has that experience. Sometimes police roll up behind you and you're just like, woo! What's up? <laughs> See you tonight. So we all have right, different stressors in our lives, including young people. And in a normal stress event, okay, it's not toxic for your body, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about toxic stress, which looks like these bottom four in the, bo in the body. One of my favorites to talk to, uh, particularly high school teachers about, is this first one. Because for a high school student, it's kind of like this. First period, second period, third period, fourth period, fifth period. And what do you notice about the slope in that graph versus the top graph? It's steep. On which side? Both. That's what kills you. Because you're bouncing stressor to stressor to stressor to stressor to stressor. A rapid influx of chemicals in your body with no recovery period because you're just moving right on to the next stressor. And ultimately, that can result in each of these other four, maladaptation, where now the most sophisticated system in your body, the stress response system, isn't even responding properly. It's all over the place. That can lead to the kid who is hyper vigilant in your class, high alert all the time, doesn't want people in his or her space. Okay? And ultimately, okay, that can lead to the student who can literally watch violence and have no reaction. Because they've experienced so much stress in their life that their system can't even activate anymore. It's flatlined. All of these
students are at this college right now. And they're not always who they, you think they are. And truth be told, it's some cats in this room right now that are carrying some of this, right? Real talk, right? We talk about first responders all the time, but some of the folks that are most deeply invested in students' lives are carrying some of that toxic stress as well. So we gotta be clear, okay? That the work we do with each other, the ways in which we love and support each other is critically important to also being able to do that for our youth. The reason that this matters so much is because exposure to this kind of toxic stress weathers your body. The best research that I've seen on this comes from Arlene Geronimus, uh, who's a presidential professor at University of Michigan Ann Arbor in their School of Public Health. And her work is widely regarded in the field. She does really high-end sort of progression analysis stuff I don't even necessarily pretend to understand. But the best summary I've seen in her work is actually in this issue of Miller McHugh. And it's free, you can get it online. Uh, and, and what I love about Arlene's work is, you know, I'm an ethnic studies professor, so I'm, I'm very interdisciplinary. And what I, love about, what I love about Arlene's work is that she, you know, a lot of times our colleagues in, in, in research will try to isolate causes, right? So, so what, what is the impact of race, right, on, on or racism, right, on stress? Or what is the impact of patriarchy on stress? Or what is the impact of poverty on stress? And what Arlene said is, is you know, that, that's cool for an academic exercise, but if you're talking about the real world, it doesn't work like that. That in the real world, there's this intersections of stressors in our lives all the time. So what happens when you've got somebody that has multiple stressors stacking on their body all the time? I want to understand that. So she studied the lives of poor black women in this cohort of poor black women. So they had poverty, and they had patriarchy, and they had racism okay, operating okay, on their bodies all the time. And what she found over a longitudinal study of these women's lives, which is reported in this issue of Miller McCune, uh, among many other of the top medical journals in the country, okay, is that when you stack stressors in people's lives, okay, it literally eats their body apart from the inside out. It weathers their body. Okay. The way that I uh, describe weathering to folks is it's like, it's like if you're poor, and or a person of color. In this society, you are born into a fight. You don't want to be in a fight. You want peace just like everybody else. Okay? But that fight is on you from jump. And so if you've ever been in a fight before, and I'm talking about like you don't want to be in no fight, right? But you, but, but you, it ain't no getting out of it. You can't run, you're backed into a corner, you won't get socked up, so you better chuck them. So you put your hands up, you get ready to go, okay? Because you got to, and you may not look like that, you haven't never been invited, you may look like something else, okay? But okay? you know okay, that you're gonna have to chuck them. What do you defend? Where do you put your hands? Right, you put them up here, why? Yeah, because that's where the glitter happens, right? That's where it's one and done. But that's all right. Because you're not fighting Mike Tyson. Because if you're fighting Mike Tyson, what happened? And somebody down here said you get your ear bit. <laughs> right. And then you get knocked out. And but you're not fighting Tyson. You're fighting a true artist of the sweet science. A pure pugilist. So you come out, you're squared up, you, you up here trying to cover as much as your body, and where do they go to work? They go to work on the body. But that's all right, because you work out at 24. You got your little six pack, eight pack, 12 pack, whatever pack you tell yourself you have. Okay? And so your, your body, okay, our bodies are built okay, to be resilient. So it's body blow after body blow after body blow after body blow. And there's an incredibly large and growing body of research okay, on what are called microaggressions. Okay. The, the, the research really now is trying to look at what, what are called racial microaggressions. These are the body blows. And the problem with these conversations is that everybody talks about stress like it's this naked event in your life. Okay? Like, 
Some white folks on a white horse wearing white sheets and white hoods show up and light a white cross on fire on your lawn. Everybody's like, that's racist. And indeed it is, and let's not pretend it doesn't still happen in certain parts of this country. Okay? Because it does. But that's not how racism operates anymore. Okay? It's, it's through microaggressions, it's through individual comments, it's through things that are said to students like, this is a great essay. Did you write this? <laughs> You're one of the most articulate Latino students I've ever had. Or you stand in the elevator and some folks walk up and go, oh, that's all right, we'll get the next one. Doors closed, you look around, what the hell is nobody else in here? <laughs> or you walking down the street and police roll up and slow down, the window comes down, radio squelches, and you know they're watching you. Or if you, in, in New York, they stop and frisk you. And over the course of your life, any one of those individual events, not a big deal. But when it happens to you day after day after day after day, class after class after class, body blow after body blow after body blow after body blow, what eventually happens to your hands? They come down and then what happens? Then you get type 2 diabetes, then you get cancer, then you get hypertension. And that's how stress is operating in your students' lives. It's exhausting them. And the problem is, is they won't show up with some digital meter that says, my allostatic book is 7.6 today, back off. Okay? That'd be dope. And by the way, if anybody's like an entrepreneur here, create that shit, every school will buy it. <laughs> but that's not going to happen. So we got to learn how to read the signs in our students, okay? in our colleagues, in our partners for that kind of toxic stress exhaustion and begin to be more responsive. So people are looking at Janelle like, hey, this is our first keynote, this is, this is who you bring. Wait, come on, come here, some positivity. We're trying to keep it light in here. My mother. 84 years old. She has recently discovered email. <laughs> Which means that I get updates on Jesus all the time. I know when he's risen, I know when he's dead, I know when there's two sets of footprints and then there's only one, and I know when my role is in that. <laughs> A few years back, I did this talk at Harvard. It was, it was me and Artie Duncan, we were the two keynotes. This is when I talked to Artie about Tupac. And uh, Artie goes on and does this little thing. And then I come on after him and I explain why everything he just said was wrong. And Harvard makes a big deal of it. They do a, you know, HD production and blast it all over YouTube. And so my brother gets hold of the YouTube link and emails it to my mom. So my mom calls me up and says, your brother just sent me the YouTube link to your Harvard talk. I'm so proud of you, son. I'm going to go on, I'm going to watch it, and I'm going to call you back and let you know what I think. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool, mom. <laughs> so about 90 minutes later, my mother calls me back. I said, what would you think, mom? She says, think you curse too much. <laughs> Good thing about my mom is she does not text message. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's not really all that important. What is important is, is that we're not screwed at all. The medical research is actually quite conclusive okay, about how to respond when working with young people that experience toxic stress environments. Okay? And in fact, it is incredibly conclusive. What the medical research has found is that the single biggest protective factor in a young person's life that experiences toxic stress is, anybody? Not school, actually school is one of the biggest toxic stressors in students' lives. She says, someone caring, absolutely right. And the key word there is someone. Okay. A caring adult. Now what's interesting about the research is, what it doesn't say is, a caring licensed adult. It just says a caring adult. 
This is critical for us that are operating at youth-serving institutions. Because what that means is everybody has to be on deck. Because it might be Rose. Okay? It might be a faculty member. It might be an administrator. It might be a groundskeeper. It might be a coach. It might be any combination. Of, we can't choose which adults young people connect with. So we all got to be on deck and we got to all understand how valuable we are in really supporting, nurturing, loving, caring, developing these young people, also known as students. An institutional commitment and effort, right? Not just certificated staff, according to our contract. Right? <laughs> and what the research is finding is the reason that caring adults matter so much is because it's been directly linked to hope levels. The medical field is actually working now to develop metrics to measure hope in the body. Because what they have found is, it is the anecdote for toxic stress. And the other interesting thing about the research is, you don't have to find this in research, but they found a one-to-one -one corollary. And what that means is, is that the, the, the number of caring adults okay, has an exponential impact on the student's ability to navigate toxic stress. So if they have one caring adult, they are less likely than if they have two. And if they have three, they're all, so it, it, literally there's no top out. The more caring adults re that register in, in these students' lives, the higher the likelihood that they navigate through successfully toxic stress and these institutions that we got. In. And the reason is, is because with each caring adult, their hope levels go up. Tick, tick, tick. Okay. Now, I told you I'm a literature teacher, so I like the word hope because if you look up the dictionary, you'll find that it's a dynamic word because it's both a noun and a verb. And as I said, it's popping up more and more in the research. These are two of my favorites. One is from psychology. A dude named Charles Snyder developed something he calls hope theory. Okay. He actually uh, measures hope using something called the children's hope scale. I use the children's hope scale in my classes to measure hope levels when students first come to me and then to look at my impact on their hope levels over time. My favorite definition of hope comes from Lynn Sign, who's president, presidential professor of public health at UC Berkeley. He defines hope as a sense of control of destiny. Okay, now, I don't know why y'all got into this gig, but that's why I got into this gig. Because I wanted to raise okay, the, the levels of sense of control of destiny. I wanted kids in my community to feel like they have control of their own destiny. And when I realized this research is that I'm a hope dealer. I know don't dealer. Don't pin that on me. But the more I done this research, the more I realized that I'm not up to anything new. In fact, what I'm talking about is the teachings of the ancestors a return okay, to our core values okay, as a human society. And the problem in this country is that we are profoundly ahistorical. We act as though history began in 1776. Most of us don't know our indigenous land, our indigenous language, our indigenous people, our indigenous practices. We've lost track of that. But if you, I don't care who you are or where your people are from, if you trace back to your indigenous ancestors, first ancestor, first civilization, I promise you that you will find the same thing that I find when I trace my ancestry back. My people are from the Mayan and the Mexica. And the Mayans had a core practice that we taught to all our children called In La Kesh. And the trip is, if y'all read Huffington Post, okay, uh, the, the state of Arizona, I shit you not, I can't make this kind of stuff up, okay? The state of Arizona just banned in La Kesh in schools. Literally, literally banned it. Okay. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm, she said, why? Okay. Stick around for Q&A, you go into that dirt. But in La Kesh, okay, this is what in La Kesh is. In La Kesh okay, is, 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 is a, it's a, a story called the story of the smoking mirror. Okay? 
And it's a principle that we would teach to all our children. It's the core principle of the Mayan civilization. And, and the ethnic studies program, the Rasa studies program in Tucson Unified taught me a lot about in La Kesh, okay? And the story of the smoking mirror goes okay, that every living being that you come across, son, is a smoking mirror. That's not the question. The question is whether or not you can muster the courage, character, and commitment to clear the smoke away. Because if you do, what will you see? You will see yourself. That was banned in Arizona public schools. Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other self. I see myself in you. Cannot be taught to children in Arizona public schools. Look it up, Huffington Post. They, they print the poem out. And I promise you, whatever indigenous culture you come from, your ancestors taught the same thing. Our relationship to each other, seeing our humanity. Now I've been in this gig a long time. And there are times when there's way more smoke between me and a student than other times. And there's time when I can actually name where that smoke came from. <laughs> but that's not the question. The question is, in those moments when there is a lot of smoke, can I muster the courage, character, and commitment to clear it away and find myself in that young person? Because the more smoke, the more they need me. The more smoke, the harder the work's going to be to clear it out and find myself, the more distance there is. And ultimately, that's the challenge of this gig. Whether or not we can muster the courage, character, and commitment to meet the needs of the highest needs students that come to us. The way that we try to do this in our community okay, is by investing in what we call critical hope, which has three components, the holy trinity of hope. The first is what I call material hope, which is first and foremost, just be badass at what you do. Just be the dopest okay, literature teacher, counselor, coach, whatever you do, just be the dopest at that ever on the planet. That's like, that's my commitment. Because that is a huge material resource in our community, to have access to highly skilled okay, teachers. Huge material resource, but that won't be enough. You're going to have to supplement that. You're going to have to know that some of your students are coming to class hungry. Feed them. You're going to have to know that some of your students don't have a way to get safely to and from class. Can we arrange transportation for them? We gotta know that some students are working an incredible number of hours and can't get the computer lab. Can we get access to them to get the resources to actually print their papers out, which we're demanding as a basic requirement for them getting ready for college. Okay. Acknowledging okay, where the gaps are and filling them okay, is the key to material hope. And the thing that frustrates me about having to talk about this still is that we've known this since 1943. Widely agreed upon across fields, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and yet we largely ignore it okay, in our institutional plan. We get credentialed okay, as colleges to serve youth without ever talking about this. Even though when Braw got up here, I heard you use the word esteem, which is right there. We, we didn't we didn't coordinate. Okay, that's why I love when students come up, because students just talk, tell it real, right? They don't know how to, like, do this shit with the PowerPoint, the slid, just like, I just, hey, help my Steve. Now I got 4.0, how about that? <laughs> because that's actually the science. Now, the trip about Maslow's hierarchy, he's for me, is the pinnacle. Self-actualization. Because you taught for a day, you know you love students to self-actualize. You love that student where you assign chapters 1, 2, and 3 for tomorrow's reading. They come back and they're like, you know, chapter 1, 2, and 3 are kind of whack, but I read the whole thing and the ending is dope. Can we talk about that now? <laughs> Those students do the best in school. Those who go above and beyond, like the self-actualize. Here's what the medical research says about self-actualization in the human population. Not coded by race, y'all. In the human population, okay? self-actualization is the natural human condition. You don't have to do anything to people to get them to self-actualize. 
Here's what the research also says. When human beings are not self-actualizing, it's because some unnatural cause is in the way. This is why PBS called the series Unnatural Causes. It is unnatural when human beings are not self-actualizing. And so the most successful programs, the most successful instructors, the most successful institutional plans are the ones that find the unnatural causes and, and clear them out of the way so students can be who they already are. They stop trying to remediate and fix kids. And they start trying to figure out how do we actually let them flourish into the roses that they already are. And the great thing about Maslow is he laid out the path. It's not rocket science. If a student is not self-actualizing, start, start at the bottom. It is highly likely that one of the four basic needs is under threat. They are hungry. Okay? They lack proper clothing. Okay? Not such a big deal in San Diego, although today was low-key cold. Okay? <laughs> they lack shelter okay? or they lack a sense of safety. If any of those four is steadily uncertain in a student's life, they cannot biologically, they cannot self-actualize. You know who knows this? Columbine. That's why when that happened in Columbine, they brought grief counselors and kept them on campus for over 10 years. Because they knew that the first grader that was four blocks away when they walked onto campus 10 years later might still have trauma. And they weren't gonna blame that kid for not doing his algebra homework. They were gonna find out why he didn't support him so he could. Because when they see a wealthy white kid walk in, that kid must be a genius. But when they see kids from my community walk in and they fail, it's because they don't work hard enough. Okay? That's a paradigm shift for the adults in the institution, not the child. And when we respond differently, so do the kids. When you get the basic needs met, then young people have to feel a sense of love and belonging, which is what I heard from you. Y'all welcome me, open arms. I came in, okay, my essays were whack. You helped me. Then you got to deal with the cycle. So many of our young people have been taught to hate themselves, to hate their language, to hate their accent, to hate their skin color, to hate their hair texture, to hate the neighborhood they come from. To hate their own families and their country of origin. And that kid can't perform long term in school. That is a biological fact. If you hate yourself, then you will stop yourself. So we have, that's why ethnic studies is so important, y'all. It's why it's so threatening and dangerous. When black and brown people begin to love themselves and see themselves, as human equals to white folks in this society, things are gonna change. The conversations are different. When I love myself as much as I love you, but when I can't love myself, that's when it's okay for me to pull the trigger on somebody who looks just like me. That's a problem, a challenge that we can take on as an institution. And when we get those three right, the students take care of it all the rest themselves as we see with bro over here. Second, what I call Socratic culture, my borrow from Cornell West. Hey, I wrote about, I've written about it, what it looks like in the classroom. This is in effect, okay, and not through a study of my own practice, through a study of, of five really successful teachers from, from South Central LA. Okay? And one of the things that I saw in their practice was that they were committed to showing the sermon, not preaching it. So we're really good right, at telling young people what to do, but a lot of times we don't actually live our lives in that way. Okay? And that's what it means to be Socratic. Okay? To be Socratic means to live your life in the same ways that you're asking students to live theirs. And this is the gap between being liked or being loved. And the truth okay, about this gap between being liked and being loved okay, is in large part about pain and sacrifice. And you see, the truth is, is that many teachers that are working in our community are outsiders to our community, and they know they're outsiders. And when you're an outsider, you act like Switzerland. You just try to keep it cool with everybody. You want no beef with nobody. Okay? And so you aim to be liked. But the teachers that changed your life, the teachers that changed my life, I didn't like them. I loved them. 
And the problem with the conversation about love, the problem with the conversation about love as a teacher is that folks are largely dishonest with us about what the cost is to love like that every day with young people. And y'all understand the cost, and I'll prove it to you. Show of hands, how many of you has ever had a personal relationship obey? Okay, San Diego honesty, always good for that. Okay, can we be honest about the Raiders and the Chargers? Yeah, y'all talk shit about us. Y'all make the playoffs this year? Sorry, no, I just caused some trauma to me. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I did this talk in Texas. I just got back from Texas. You can imagine how I go over in Texas. But it's all right, cause I, I was in Austin. Uh, so I did this for, for, for all of Austin Unified, all their teachers. And I asked that question, like everyone raised their hand, and then this one woman is sitting in the aisle next to the mics. And she reaches over and grabs the mic and goes, yeah, and he's right there. <laughs> and that was precisely my response. I was like, go ahead, it's way more interesting than anything I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I want to see some trauma, here it comes. <laughs> so I'm talking about the one where you got your heart stomped out. I'm talking about the one that made you fundamentally doubt love. That one. After you got crushed, who paid for your pain? Now San Diego silence. <laughs> I mean, keep it real. Who paid? Oh, she, yours must be fairly recent. <laughs> She's like the next person. <laughs> All right, we have, a, we have a name for it in this society. It's called a rebound. Right? And the reason for that is, right, the reason that the people that were closest to you, including the next person, paid the biggest cost for that pain is because that's the natural human instinct. The natural human instinct is to protect yourself. And yet we are asked every day as educators to put our heart on our chest, okay? get it stomped out by young people, because as they say, okay, hurt people hurt people. So we work with young people that are hurt. Okay? We try to love the hell out of them, okay? and they hurt us back sometimes. Okay? And the natural human instinct is to be like, I ain't going there again. Let me, let me reel that. If you don't go into your next relationship being like, I know we just met, we probably think about getting married. Okay? You go back into the next relationship at arm's length. And if you are currently in a relationship that has lasted and is healthy, it's because that person gently pushed your arm down and said, that's all right. That ain't me. And I know you're bringing baggage with you. And we can unpack that one piece at a time until we get through all of it. And then six months later, they said, by the way, I got some baggage too. Can we get to mine now? <laughs> that is the truth okay, about love. Okay? This is why Socrates said all great undertakings are risky. And as they say, what is worthwhile is always difficult. The truth about love is that love is not the absence of conflict. We act as though love, we have Pollyannish narrative of love in this country. It's all based on the notebook. Love is not the absence of conflict. Love is the presence of conflict with the courage, character, and commitment to find your way through. And we often get into relationships of conflict with students and presume that that is the end of the teacher-student relationship. But that is the beginning of the teacher-student relationship because that is what love is born out of. Can we find the courage, character, and commitment to find our way through the conflict, still love and support that student? That is the truth about this gig that people are generally dishonest about in the public discourse about teaching. And that, y'all, is why teachers drink. <laughs> Third is audacious hope. Because if we gotta do this, you better be out. I understand what I'm asking here. Okay? I've been in the gig two decades. Okay? I know what the cost is. I know what the reward is. I understand how difficult it is, and I understand what it means to fail at this effort every single day, to come up short. And to do that continually requires us to embrace Lisa Delpit's book, titled, Other People's Children. 
Lisa Delpit says that one of the biggest problems we face in this field is that so many educators see the young people they work with as other people's children. And other people's children can fail. Right? Other people's children can be put on academic probation, kicked out, sent, sent their way, sit, given tough love. Right? All, but what about your son? What about your daughter? How many angles would you work? How many programs would you try? How many hours would you pump in? It is the impossible ask, and yet it is what we know is the most successful at meeting the students who need us the most. Now, the way we think about doing this in our community is by thinking about the space where we do the work as a micro ecosystem. What I have laid out for you today is a meta ecosystem. And the truth of the matter is, is that racism, poverty, police brutality, inequality, homophobia, patriarchy, all these things, they're real. The medical field has measured them continuously for the past 10 decades. The debate in that field is over about whether or not those things are real. The question is about what's the response going to be. So those things are going to come into this institution. They are going to be part of the fabric of your classroom. The question is, how will you respond? The meta ecosystem can be altered by the micro ecosystem. You can dig where you stand. You can affect the soil that those students come into every day that they engage with you. That is within your threshold of impact. The best description I've heard about why this matters comes from a medical doctor, a woman named Tamara Jones, who wrote an article for a medical journal called The Gardener's Tale. And she tells this story about how she's, uh, Tamara's on the, the teaching faculty uh, at the medical school at Columbia University in New York. And she had just been hired on the faculty and her and her husband by a brownstone and she's walking up the stairs to the door of their house and she gets to the top, she looks to the right and she sees a window and just underneath the window there's a flower box. She turns to her husband and says, that should be our first project. And her husband, like any smart partner, says back, absolutely dear, brilliant. <laughs> so that weekend they go to the gardening store. She buys a bag of soil and a packet of flower seeds. And she comes back and she's getting ready to put the soil in to the flower box. And as she leans in, she realizes there's a partition splitting it in half. And on one side, there's already soil and the other side is empty. So she takes the fresh soil and she puts it in on the empty side. And then she takes the packet of seeds and splits it in half. And she needs half of the seeds into the soil that was already there and half of the seeds into the new soil. And she says over the next several weeks and months, she made sure that both sides got plenty of water and plenty of light. And she says what happened next was the most important medical discovery of her career. Because on the side with the fresh soil, all the seeds grew to full height, vibrant colors, and they made space for each other in the box. But on the other side, she realized that that soil was old and rocky and devoid of some key nutrients. And on that side, only a few of the seeds grew. And they grew to middling height, and they crowded each other in the box for the few resources that existed. And she says, what I realized in that moment is how much place matters. That's how much you matter. Because you can impact the soil in the place where you serve these young people every day. You can do that. No matter what the institutional constraints, no matter what the meta ecosystem, you can alter the soil where you dig every day. Great gardeners never blame the seeds for not growing. They look at the soil that they are tilling and they find ways to alter the nutrients to serve that seed so that it can grow into what it is organically already. 22 years, y'all. I have never had a perfect year. I have never had a perfect semester. I have never had a perfect unit. I have never had a perfect week. I have never had a perfect day, and I have never had a perfect class period, not once. But I wake up every day expecting to, knowing that I won't. And in order to do that, I have to be audacious. Do not let this institution crush your audacity to believe that you can meet the needs of every kid that crosses your path. But know that you won't. And if we can wrap our arms around each other around that, then we're going to wrap around our arms around a hell of a lot more students than we currently do. I'm going to end by giving you some insight into what I think this really looks at, looks like in real time. 
and one of the best examples that I've heard about what critical hope actually looks like comes from this woman. Who tells a story in an interview she did with Dave Chappelle. You can piece that together for yourself, my image of Dave Chappelle, one room, one conversation, that's deep just by itself. And I have next to her a book that my colleague at San Francisco State wrote, a brother named Sean Genwright. And, and the reason I have Sean's book up there is because of the subtitle. In the subtitle, he talks about radical healing. The conditions okay, that the most vulnerable youth are experiencing are radical. So they demand a radical response. And the kind of work that I'm talking about doing, the kind of things that you're going to hear from Maya Angelou, are not healing. They're radical healing. So when you think about these measures in your work, think about radicalizing them, going one click further, one notch farther. And in my mind, this story from Maya is what I mean by critical hope. Adam Singleton was doing his movie, Code of Justice, and he asked, would I uh, come out to Los Angeles and do a cameo? I walked out of my trailer that morning, and there was one young man cursing like you could see the blue come out of his mouth. And then he and another fellow, they were at each other's throat. They had each other's clothes. So I went up to one young man and I said, excuse me, may I speak to you? Because I wouldn't give I said, I'm Sam. But may I speak to you for a minute? He said, if these little I said, uh -huh. I've heard that before. But do you know how important you are? Do you know that our people slept in lay spoon fashion in the filthy ashes of slave ships, in their own and in each other's excrement and urine and menstrual flow, so that you can live 200 years later? Do you know that? Do you know that our people stood on auction blocks? so that you could live. He said, I snubbed it, and this one, when's the last time anyone told you how important you are? And he started to, the tears started to come out. I had no Kleenex or anything, so I just wiped his face with my hands and talked to him. And Miss Janet Jackson came. She said, that's Angelo. I don't believe you actually talked to two guys your core. So I didn't know two guys your core. I didn't know six guys. <laughs> because it, in my life and my age group, you understand? It just didn't, I didn't know that. Two guys' mother wrote me another. She said her son had called her right after I had spoken to him. And she wanted to thank me. She said, you may have saved his life. And I thank you, Dr. Angela. And in one story, she painted more human picture of him than the entire media did during his career. You know, people were afraid of him, but the media made it like he was a scary thing. And she talked about it like he was a young man, a, a confusing and difficult situation. And that's kind of what I like about Dr. Angela. Because I know I'm not perfect and, and whatever, but it's something that she she can look at me and she kind of she can kind of put the picture together. She knows I'm just a, a dude trying to figure it out. Each of us has a chance to be somebody, and it's my delight that you would ask for me so that I can have the pleasure, the joy, the thrill of talking to you so that I can be somebody. For me, that's master pedagogy. Okay. The best... The best educators that I've been around in the world find the lesson inside the lesson. The educators that are struggling to reach portions of their students insist on the lesson that they've designed. We're all gonna design lessons, but the real magic in the work that we do 
is whether or not we can read and react to how students are responding to those, find the lesson that they're finding in that, and then circle it back to the lesson that we know we need them to get in order to navigate this institution. That's the real mastery that you hear from Maya here. Now, why does it matter? Well, let's continue this story. So Maya intervenes in Tupac's life circa 1991. She's on the set of Poetic Justice. And according to Tupac's own mother, right, that intervention, that moment where she takes the time, and mind you, she's not intervening in Tupac's life. She doesn't even know who Tupac is. She doesn't know who Six Pack is. Okay. She's intervening in whose life? It's not Tupac's, huh? Someone who needs it? No way. There's no way that a Nobel Peace Prize laureate nominee in literature, a grandmother on a movie set, walks out of her trailer, sees two young brothers that she does not know about to fight, and runs down and is like, go fight! No way. Nobody does that. So whose life is she intervening in? Her own. That's my son. And you know damn well if you have kids like I do, that if you saw your son about to fight, there would be no processing. There would be no, what does my contract say to do here? I mean, what are my intervention strategies? What's the number of the counselor? You would immediately intervene. And so she sees her son in those boys. That's why she intervenes. And when she intervenes, what is Tupac's reaction? Is he like, oh, thanks a lot. I don't really want to fight, dude. Anyway, you just saved me an asshole. <laughs> is that his reaction? What's his reaction? He curses her out. Okay, hey, don't do that. Do not curse out grandmothers, ever. <laughs> he curses her out. What's her reaction? It's all right. You need me to carry that right now? I'll carry it. What's his reaction? Time two. Curses her out again, three times. I see teachers intervene in students' lives. And the students don't know how to accept it, or they push back, or stay out of my business, or whatever. And the teacher's like, well, fine, then you don't want my help, you can figure it out yourself. But not Maya, why not? Because she's not intervening in a student's life. She's intervening in the life of her son. And when you inter intervene in the life of your son or daughter, you don't stop them until they understand how much you love them, until they understand how valuable they are to this community and to our lives. And that's why pop breaks down. So this happened circa 1991, and because it does, pop goes on to live five more years. And if you study Tupac as an artist, as I do, you will find that that was the five most productive artistic years of his life. He wrote so much material during the period between 1991 and 1996 that they could not publish it all before he was killed in 96. And one of the albums that he wrote during that period is an album called Resurrection, which gets published in 2003, seven years after his death. In 2009, my homie snaps this photo in Kathmandu, all the way across the world. It is a picture of three brothers standing in front of one of the largest Buddhist shrines in the world. The oldest brother is turned to the right to the middle brother whose hand is on his head because he is weeping. And the baby brother on the left is watching, learning, empathy. And what you might not catch about this photo is the shirt that the oldest brother is wearing. That is the album shirt from Tupac's Resurrection album. And that is why intervening in your student, your Tupac's life matters so much. Because it is the Tupac, it is the roses that are growing in the concrete that are the most likely to be able to speak to the roses that are growing in the concrete behind them. They are the ones that will change the body. They are the ones that will change the hood. They are the ones that will stop the triggers. The hood will save the hood. And we have a role in that.
can we meet the challenge to meet the needs of our highest needs students so that they can change their communities and this nation forever. To me, that's the ultimate challenge of what it means to be an educator. The point of education is not to escape poverty. The point of education is to end it. Thank you.